and with people, you know, with people asking questions about their cars and if they wanted to buy a new car. And so tonight's program is going to be about handling driving emergencies. Well, Take thanks. It uh, it's great. <laughs> it's great to be back again. The problem is I never know where I'm back to with all this virtual stuff. I could be yeah. I could be anywhere. <laughs> so uh, but it's great to be back. And yeah, today's program is going to be really about how to handle some driving emergencies. And they all can they all can happen. I got a call from a adventure reporter, a woman who writes about kayaking and mountain climbing and and all kinds of crazy stuff. And she in her cross country trip with her and her son had about all the same problems we're going to talk about now. Flat tires, you know, a deer running out in front of them, uh, a flood, um, you know, bad storms. So we're going to kind of touch on some of those things tonight and some of the things that you can do to try to make sure that if you get in that situation, kind of the safest way to get out of it. So um, just for clarification, I'm John Paul, sometimes known as AAA's Car Doctor. My real title is Senior Manager of Traffic Safety and Public Affairs. Um, but I try to help people with their car questions. I try to help people with their safety related questions. Um, I'm not Somebody called me yesterday and asked me some advice about a car crash they were in, and I had to remind them that I'm not an attorney, um, but I do have a fairly good um, handle on traffic law and how things work. So um, so I try to help people with that. Um, and uh, I've been at AAA for more than 35 years now. So, um, so I just want to kind of talk about, talk about this presentation. I have some slides to show. Um, and it's a, uh, so we'll go over some of the slides and I'll stop and talk a little bit more and hopefully try to help people. So hopefully you can see the handling driving emergencies traffic safety workshop. Hopefully you see that. And, um, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things we want to talk about is maintenance. Lack of car maintenance is one of the big reasons why people can get into trouble. It can be a ball tire. It can be a, uh, it can be a belt that breaks. It can be brake lines that are rusty. It can be, um, it can be a muffler that falls off all different kinds of, all different kinds of things that can cause um, those kinds of problems. And we want to talk about those tonight. So we'll talk about what to do if your car breaks down and ha how to handle those emergencies. So the best thing to do always is to Avoid trouble, but be prepared. Keep your vehicle in as good a condition as possible. Inspect it before every trip. Anybody, if you talk to anybody who's ever been a truck driver, they will always tell you before they, before they go out and drive their truck, they always do something called a circle check. So they walk around their truck and they make sure all the lighting is working. They make sure the tires are in good shape. They look for anything leaking out from underneath it. And not that we expect anyone to do that, but we but it would be good if everybody did a little bit of that. Um, so, you know, do you need to go check all the fluids before a trip? No, but maybe you need to go out and make sure something didn't end up behind one of the tires. Um, up until a little while ago in the town that I live in, we had our own trash bin and we had a recycling bin, so a big plastic bucket. And now we have these big carts on wheels that move around. But prior to this, we had these recycling bins. And every once in a while, uh, when the recycling bin would get empty, emptied, um, you know, a bottle or some something somebody went to recycle would get fall out of the fall out of the bin and it ended up getting blown around the neighborhood and one day I came out and it was a um, it was it was kind of funny I can't remember it was it was a, a an empty bottle of I think it was um, vinegar but it was right behind the back wheel of my car so if I went to back up I would have driven right over it and probably got a flat tire so it doesn't hurt to kind of walk around your car make sure all the you know make sure nothing happened to it all the lights are in good shape um, just give it a quick once over. That's always important. If you're planning a long trip, uh, you should certainly e either bring it in for service or at least do a little bit of rudimentary stuff, checking the fluids. There's anywhere up to nine different vital fluids in a car. Most of the time we look at four or five, but it's important to look at those. 
keep your, you know, make sure you have your cell phone with you, but also have a cell phone charger. Sometimes what happens is if your car breaks down, um, you're kind of sitting there on the phone, you get a little bit bored, you call some friends, next thing you know, your battery's going dead, then what happens? So then you're kind of stuck. So uh, keep, a, keep your cell phone charged, but also make sure that um, you have that cell phone charger just in case. And carry an emergency and first aid kit. Uh, we'll go over some of those things to carry. It's a good idea to carry some little first aid kit. Also important to carry, carry any medication you might need with you. I'm old enough where I remember the legendary New England, I was actually in it, the legendary New England uh, blizzard of 78, where people were stuck in their cars for three days out on the, uh, out on Route 128, the loop outside of Boston. And one of the big concerns was people that had medical conditions that didn't have their medication with them. So having a little bit of medication or, you know, whether you're somebody that periodically needs to eat or snack or something because of uh, medical conditions, your blood sugar goes up or down or whatever the case is, um, just be prepared. And sort of, you know, in the Boy Scout theme, you know, always, you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best. That's the best thing you can always do whenever you're Whenever you're planning, even if it's just a little short trip, you don't think much of it, it's always good to plan for the worst possible thing. So breakdowns happen. They happen all the time. In fact, um, six out of 10 AAA members will call us for road service. That translates into about, in my AAA territory, which is five states, that translates into nearly 4 million road service calls a year. So 4 million people have car problems that call AAA. And it might be, you know, you've locked your keys in your car, you ran out of gas, but most of the time it's towing related. You wanna get your car towed because it broke down. It won't start. So making sure you have a good battery in your car or you have a flat tire or, or low tire or no tire in some cases. So those are the major reasons. So if you can eliminate some of those, so in other words, carry an extra key with you if possible. So if you do lock your keys in your car, um, you have an extra key so you can get in. Um, make sure your tires in your car are in good shape. Make sure your battery's in good shape. Um, AAA members can have their batteries tested it does count as a road service call, but you can you can actually call road service up um, about 18 hours a day. So not we won't come out and test your battery at two in the morning if you have insomnia, but we will come out and test your battery at eight o'clock at night. Um, so if you called us up and said, uh, hey, can you come out and test my battery? It's five years old and I just want to see if it's OK. We'll come out and test it. And if it's bad, we'll sell you a new one if you want to buy it. So, you know, we'll do so, but if you can take care of a few of those things, that's the best thing to do. So to maintain your car, what should you do? You should do this walk around before each trip I was talking about. Just kind of make sure the car is okay. Make sure that you're not driving away on a, on a tire that's half inflated. Um, look for that, you know, maybe you, you know, you start up your car, uh, you turn the headlights on and you, Look, you walk around the car, make sure all the lights are on. Uh, the windshield wipers, turn them on, make sure they're working, make sure they clean the windshield okay. Um, it's a whole lot easier to get windshield wipers replaced before you need them rather than you're driving down the road. It, we had a weird torrential downpour here yesterday, but if you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you find out your windshield wipers aren't working properly or a piece of them fell off, you know, those, those are the kind of things that can get you into trouble. And if you can get, if you can do some sort of monthly inspection of all the vital fluids, that's always a nice thing too. So basic maintenance items, wiper blades, make sure the oil's in good shape, check all those fluids, belts, hoses, tires. If the brakes feel funny, don't take any chances. Wiper fluid, the spring to me is the time of year you go through more wiper fluid, washer fluid than any other time because your you're driving down the road, you get that kind of salty spray that, you know, melting snow that's on the road, it kicks up on your windshield, and you're constantly washing your windshield, then all of a sudden you run out of windshield washer, and you turn the wipers on and all it does is smear it and then you can't see very well. So filling washer fluids very easy, 
most of the time it looks just like the picture here with the little picture of a washer. Um, there's different kinds of wiper fluid, the kind of blue stuff that's $1.99 a bottle. You can get a little fancier stuff that's a little bit more expensive that maybe helps keep the windshield a little bit cleaner. But the important part is you wanna make sure you use wiper fluid designed for New England Northeast weather because um, I was at, a few years ago, there was a windshield washer shortage of all things. Who knew there would be, you know, well, who knew there would be toilet paper shortages, but, um, but there was a windshield washer shortage and I was at a store and they had a big sign that said windshield washer fluid. And I looked at it and it said, protects to 10 above zero. Well, 10 above zero is fine if you live in South Carolina or Florida, but that's not the washer fluid you wanna use in the Northeast because fluid that only protects the 10 above zero could freeze in the winter time and it could do damage to your windshield washer system. So you wanna look at it and, say, and make sure that it says, you know, winter, winter time use or some, it'll have some indication it's good to minus 20 below zero, you know, something like that. But you don't want one, if, if you see something that looks a little odd, kind of look and see what the temperature of it is. You know, fine for the summertime, but not something you want to have in there in the winter. Same thing, you don't want to add just plain water to your windshield washer because it could freeze and, and it can do a fair amount of damage. So you want to take care of that. Making sure the oil is full. Um, easy to check the oil. Um, there's an engine oil dipstick. It's easy to check. Even if you don't do it, um, you know, periodically once a you know, if you have your oil changed twice a year, even, um, you know, most good garages, if you come back in every couple of months and just say, hey, you know, I had my oil changed here a month, you know, six months ago or three months ago. Can you just uh, do a quick check and see how the fluids are doing? Most most are happy to do that. Um, brake fluid, you want to make sure the brake fluid is full. The brake fluid reservoir sort of looks like that picture. And uh, if you notice it's low, my suggestion is bring it to a repair shop to get it looked at because it could be an indication of the leak. Tires, there's no other part of your car that touches the ground except your tires. And you wanna make sure that the tires are in good condition. And by good condition, properly inflated, but also uh, you wanna make sure that the tires have enough tread. To find out where the tire inflation number is, it's actually inside the car. When you open up the driver's door, there's a little placard that looks just like the one in the picture and it'll tell you how much air to put in your tire. Some people are mistaken. They look at the tire and there's a number on the tire and they go, oh, that must be, you know, it says 35. So that's what I should put in. That's really the maximum inflation pressure. That isn't what you want to use. Um, tire depth gauge, well, you can get a fancy gauge to measure the depth of the tire to see what kind of shape it's in. But if you have a quarter, it will do the same thing. If you take a quarter and go across the tread in the tires, and if the tread comes up to at least washing his head, the tire is good enough. It's not brand new, but it's good enough. And it's going to give you decent results on the road. Um, all tires actually have a a date that they were manufactured. And usually it's some kind of code. So this picture is an old picture. These tires were manufactured in the 27th week of 2004. So if you happen to have a 2004 car with only 20,000 miles on it, say, you could conceivably have this tire on your car. And this is not a tire that you'd want to have on your car for, for any kind of long term because tires have somewhere between a six and a 10 year life. And a tire like this that was as old as it is, it's 16 years old, is more likely to break down, it's more likely to blow out, it's more, it'd be more subject to, you know, you hit a pothole just right and it conceivably could blow out. A good roadside emergency kit in case of emergency is a good idea. Um, they're in the, I wanna stop sharing for a minute. be back to me. And, you know, some of the things you should carry. Uh, this is a reflective triangle, like, like the one that was in the picture. It opens up and you put it out in case your car breaks down. I will tell you that I had a reflective triangle in my car and I put it out once 
and it got run over by somebody, which was good. It got run over rather than me getting run over, but you know, it was good. It got run over. Um, it's always a good idea. You never know if you're going to be out um, changing a flat tire, something happens to your car, pair of gloves, good idea. Um, everybody should have it, but excuse me a minute here. Um, I work in a parking lot that normally pre COVID had about 550 people that worked there. Do you know how many people didn't have a snow brush with them? You know, that first snowstorm of the year, they, you know, they're out there trying to, uh, trying to clean the snow and ice off their car with their, with their, we have little badges to get into the building. They're trying to scrape the windshield with their little badge. Um, even if you got a little simple, very, you know, simple ice scraper, something to just scrape the windshield with, but a snow brush like this can be a big, big help in the, in the winter time. And I always kept one kind of under my desk at work because um, I wanted to go out and brush the snow off the car. Usually what happens is your snow brush is in your car, right? And you open up your car and the snow falls in the front seat and then you're sitting on snow on the ride home. So I always, I always kind of like to keep one spare. This is the, one of the goofiest things I ever got. Um, this is actually a collapsible cone and it actually flashes. And because of what I do, somebody bought this for me for Christmas once. Um, it kind of, but it is, but it is, it is kind of handy. And I, I have, I've actually used it before. Um, if you are going to be out on the road working, you know, changing a flat tire, um, this is a reflective vest. Um, you can put it on so you're just a little bit more visible to the traffic. Um, I talked about medication, and this is, and I, I put a bottle of uh, pain reliever, I guess some sort of aspirin kind of stuff, in here just to remind me to say, you know, if you need medication, always oh, keep a little quantity of it with you. Um, some of the other things. A, uh, a simple first aid kit, it doesn't have to be complicated, but a simple first aid kit is important. Um, more times, we don't see it much anymore, but still people do, a uh, lock de-icer. So, you know, most everybody has a key fob that they get into the car, but not everybody does. And sometimes you need to use a key and the lock will freeze. And this is just a little thing that, uh, that you can stick in the lock actually work in your house too. Um, this one is kind of interesting because um, a woman I work with in the building, I didn't know who she was. She came over to me and said, my door locks are frozen. You don't happen to have any lock de do you? And I had a little can of lock de like this. And I said, well, just keep it. I'm never going to use it for anything. And she, uh, she used it. She got into her car and the next day she brought me a new one. So that's why I happen to have it. Um, you know, windshield, windshield de-icer spray, not a bad, and it's got a built-in scraper, so it kind of, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, a flashlight of some sort, but here's the problem with flashlights. Um, this is a good example. It, the battery's in it's dead. It's been dead for a while. Um, so if you do have a flashlight in your car, and a lot of people say, well, I don't need a flashlight. My phone's got a flashlight in it. Yeah, yeah, it kind of does, but not really. Um, this is a little um, rain poncho. You know, if you're going to, if it's really pouring rain, you probably shouldn't be out anyway. But, you know, if you are out, um, it's a handy thing to have in your car just in case. And all of this stuff is all sitting in a little sports bag, a little tiny sports bag. So it looks like a ton of stuff, but it's not really. This is, I'm afraid to take this out of the package. This is one of those sort of camping blankets that's made out of, you know, NASA style aluminum foil. But you know, it's never going back in the package again. Because it's actually, it's actually, I think, four feet square. So how they fit it in here, I don't really know. And I'm afraid to take it out. But if you were stuck somewhere, this thing does two things. If you were stuck and you were cold, you could wrap it around you, and it would help keep you warm. But also, if you were changing a flat tire, and the weather was 
lousy out and it was kind of dirty and muddy, you could open this up and spread it down, spread it on the ground so you don't get dirty. Um, that in a minute. You know, does it hurt to have a couple of basic hand tools in your car? A little wrench or something? Can't hurt. Um, the, you know, this is just wire. It's almost, it's heavier than florist wire, but it's just wire. And I wish I had this with me. I wasn't in my own car a week or so ago because the person in front of me pulled over when their muffler fell off the car. And it didn't quite completely fall off, but the end of it fell off where it was dragging on the ground. And I, you know, if I had some wire, you could have wrapped it around it at least and tied it back up so it wasn't dragging on the ground. Um, I pulled, I, you know, went and checked and um, I said, you know, go try to find a coat hanger or something somewhere so you can, uh, you can hopefully, you know, get that so you're not dragging it down the road. Um, the other kind of interesting thing to keep. And I think we've covered enough about ice scrapers, but I seem to have a variety of them here. Um, I always like to keep a bungee cord of some kind. You never know if you stop somewhere for whatever you you, you found something interesting at a yard sale and you can't you can't close the back of your car or your trunk or anything. At least you can bungee cord it so it's sort of closed. So it just comes in handy. And finally, I got, I got this in the mail the other day. And it's, it's actually pretty interesting because it's a flashlight. So it's a flashlight and it has, it's an emergency light. So it flashes, it can flash red and it's a regular flashlight. But one of the other interesting things about it is there's a lithium ion battery in here. And what's nice about it is that under this little cover, there's a place where you can plug in this plug and it becomes jumper cables. So you've probably seen those commercials for the little, little things. And it's like, this thing jump starts 20 cars. This does the same thing and it won't jumpstart a tractor trailer truck, but the idea that it's a flashlight and you can jumpstart your own car and it's also polarity protected. So in other words, what that means is you can't hook it up backwards. So it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, this isn't an endorsement of sorts, but um, it's put out by the works company. They, they do all the infomercials for, you know, lawn cleaning, you know, blowers and leaf blowers and weed whackers and, but they make this roadside light. And uh, it was, it. and what's kind of nice about it is that the flashlight on the bottom acts as a stand. So if you put it, so if you put it down on the ground, you got something to stand up on, you can turn the light on and you can see like changing a, changing a flat tire or something, you can turn the light on. So it makes, it's kind of handy. And um, I had to do something up in my attic the other day and this showed up, um, that day. And I said, Oh, what's this? And I, and, uh, I looked at it and I went, Oh, this will be perfect. I, I need to go up in the attic and I have to go over in the corner where it's really dark and I won't be able to see. And it, it, I, I think I had it on for an hour up there and it was, it was awful handy to have. So, you know, having something like that in your trunk, in your glove compartment that can, you can jumpstart your own car with it, but have a flashlight in case of emergencies and a flashing light if your car is broken down is pretty handy. Um, I do recommend that if you are doing anything under the hood, um, for, you know, if you're jump starting a car, or whatever the case is, you should always have some kind of safety glasses. These look like sunglasses, but they're actually, they're actually safety glasses. Um, these are just tinted. Uh, we give these to all of our drivers. So if they're doing a jump start or even, you know, even they're out by the side of the highway, a lot of dirt and stuff blows up while you're, while you're driving. So having, having your, your eyes protected is important. Looks kind of weird tonight, but, um, 
but it is but it is important. So you know the roadside kit that um, we'll go back to sharing the screen here. Um, the roadside kit um, kind of had a variety of those things. Jump it had jumper cables and the gloves and the safety glasses and and some other stuff, flashlight and stuff. But I like to put my own kit together and use the stuff that I know I'm going to use most often. And that is that is the the um, you know so. You know, you can buy these kits and we, and we have them too. And you can buy these kits and sometimes it includes stuff you're never going to use. Um, in my own cars, I have a, one of those, one of those jumpstart packs. It's not the one with the built-in flashlight, like the, the one I just showed, uh, but I have a jumpstart pack so I can jumpstart my own car without any help. I have a portable air compressor that I can plug into like the cigarette lighter or hook up to the battery under the hood, where if I have a low tire, I can air up the tire. And then, you know, flares or something else in case in case you're really broken down and a pair of gloves and, and a little first aid kit because you never know you're changing a flat tire and you nick your knuckle or something. It's nice to have a Band-Aid to put on. So, and then each car has a snow brush in it. Each car has an ice scraper in it. And I just want to make sure that I'm ready in case of some kind of emergency. So I like to put my own kit together. I find that's the, that's the best thing to, to do is to do something you know you're going to use. If you never know you're going to use hand tools, don't put them in there. Um, but what to do if your car breaks down? The first thing on the list here is the hardest, and that's don't panic. Um, use the brakes gradually, so slow down nice and easy. Uh, signal and coast as much as you can. You should always try to get over to the right side of the road. Some roadways have left side breakdown lanes. Um, they are less preferred than the right-hand side. I would try to stay with the right. Um, be careful as you're pulling, pulling off the road in case, you know, say it's you're trying to pull off the road and you don't realize, especially if you are on the highway and you're doing 65 or 70 and maybe your car develops a flat tire or something happens and you go to pull off, you don't sometimes realize how fast you're going. And all of a sudden you pull off the edge of the road and maybe you're not going to slide down a ditch, but you might get, you might be going too fast to go into something that's not paved anymore. So, um, so beware of those roadside hazards and try to stop off the road as far as possible. Um, we just did a press conference today reminding everyone that when they see someone, uh, whether they see a red light, a blue light, an orange light, yellow light, um, by the side of the road to slow down or move over, preferably move over, get out of the lane, let the person there doing their job. And same thing if you're broken down by the side of the road and you decide that you're gonna change a flat tire, um, keep in mind that people, professionals get injured every year um, working by the side of the road. And we have, we have uh, you know, we have tow trucks with lots of lights on them and people run into the tow trucks. So if you are going to do something, be very careful, put your warning device out far away from the back of the car. Like when I was changing a flat tire, my triangle got run over. It was about 150 feet away from the back of my car. Um, Whole, whole lot better letting that get run over than get me get, let me get run over. The guy, the guy who hit it, I could actually, I looked up when I heard it and he didn't look happy because he hit something with his new car. But on the other hand, he should have been paying attention and seen this reflector and it was in the breakdown lane. So it wasn't like I put it out in the travel lane. It was in the breakdown lane. So be careful if you are going to be out there. Um, once you're on the shoulder, put your emergency flashes on if it's going to work. You want to let people know you're broken down. The old idea of raising the hood to let people know your car is broken down still works today. Um, like I said, the warning triangles. If you can try to figure out where you are, you'd be surprised how many road service calls we still get today that people go, I broke down, but I'm not sure where I am. And sometimes, sometimes with our uh, road service app, we can actually, and if they have a smartphone, we can actually locate them. Other times, we actually ask them to call 911 and ask the police if they can triangulate their phone, just like the, just like the detective sh shows on TV when they ping someone's phone. They really can ping your phone and figure out where you are. Um, I mean, if, even if we have a guess, if somebody says, oh, I'm between exit 9 and 11, we'll send a truck to drive up and down between exit 9 and 11 and try to find you. 
Um, so, you know, it, it is one of those, you know, try to figure out where you are. I was going into Boston one time and my alternator went on my car and the road service person, and I always call road service just like I'm a regular member, not like I'm an employee. And the road service person said, where are you? And I said, I'm about 150 feet away from the sign that says entering Boston. And they said, what road, what road are you on? I said, well, this is where Boston gets complicated. I was on route one, route three and route 93. Uh, and, they, and the person said, well, it can't all be this. You got to be on one or the other. And I said, I can take a picture of the sign that says exactly that, because all these Boston has this goofiest roads in the world, because, you know, especially downtown Boston, downtown Boston was farming that cow paths were turned into roads. So um, it's easy to get confused, but try to try to get as much information as you can. And I gave the, the our call receiver very specific, you know, about here at this exit, not to be confused with this other exit, which sounds exactly the same, and they were able to find me. But um, you want to you want to try to be you want to try to be as aware of your situation as possible, especially if you're calling for help. So if you're calling for help, whether it's AAA help or or your own road service provider or the police, even you want to just be able to tell them where you are. That's kind of the problem with. Um, Sometimes just calling 911, you get the 911 dispatcher. And as you're driving, it could be, it may not be um, the state police. It may be a little, they'll connect you to the local police that have to come out and find you. Uh, some, some states uh, still have star 77, which is the state police. So if you press star 77 on your phone, you get the closest state police barracks. Most of the time it's just 911. So the emergencies, what we run into, blowouts, Brake failure, you know, um, like it says in this uh, magazine picture, uh, when bad things happen to good drivers, so in other words, bad things to good people, doesn't mean you did anything wrong, just things happen. So if a tire blows out, well, you may lose control of your, of your car. Uh, but important is, go back to the first thing we talked about, don't panic. Um, two hands on the wheel, don't make any quick movements. Um, a car will run amazingly well with three good tires and one flat tire. It will run amazingly well. And if you ever have the chance to talk to somebody who's actually had a wheel fall off a car. So in other words, you're driving down the road and all of a sudden one of your four wheels just falls off. And what happens is, and I don't know the physics behind it, when a wheel falls off a car, the wheel goes faster than the car is going because it gains momentum. And most people look over and go, oh, look, someone lost a wheel and it's actually them. Um, so, you know, things can happen, but you don't want to, even in that worst case, when that thing, when that happens, when a wheel completely falls off your car, it's amazing how well the car will still handle until you do something like jam on the brakes, then that can be a real problem. So you want to slow the car gradually, ease off the gas pedal, even take your foot off the gas nice and easy, and then pull off to the shoulder where it's safe. Um, if you lose your brakes, first thing, so you step on the brake and the brake pedal goes to the floor. And you're like, oh no, now what? Pump the brake a bunch of times, try to get the try to get a little bit more brake fluid flowing through the system. That will help slow the car down. Shifting into a lower gear won't stop the car, but it will slow it. Put your emergency flashes on. Try using the emergency brake or the parking brake. Um, if you have a parking brake with the handle in the middle of the car um, with the little push button on it, push the button down and lift up the handle and use that to slow the car. Why you wanna push down the button is you don't wanna yank up on the parking brake or on the foot operated ones, jam the parking brake pedal down and have it lock up the rear wheels. That's the where the parking brake works. And it can cause the car to skid. So you're just using the parking brake to slow the car, not stop it. If you have to rub the tires against a curb to slow it down. So, you know, you everybody's hit a curb with their car. That curb can also slow the car down if you don't have any brakes. And last resort, hit something soft. Uh, if you have to. So you may have been out in the highway once and you've seen um, uh, 
truck runaway ramp. So it looks like a ramp that goes nowhere. It's all filled with um, crushed stone. It's when a truck loses its brakes, they can use that to slow the car down. So they go into it and the, and the, uh, the crushed stone just kind of gathers up all around the front of the truck and, and slows the truck down. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, just if you're on a two lane road or four lane road, but kind of rural, and all of a sudden you go to step on the brakes and you find out you don't have good brakes in your car anymore. You know, just driving into a field is enough to slow the car down. Then the one thing you don't want to do is say, hey, the brakes feel okay now, I'll go back to driving. No, you want to get the car towed someplace. You know, get being out in the road with, with bad brakes is just irresponsible. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we've had some of the weirdest weather lately that we ever have, I think. Um, yesterday, we it said we might have a thunderstorm. I looked out the window, it looked like a hurricane in Florida around my house. It was pouring rain, the power went out, and 15 minutes later, it was gone. Um, but I was looking at the road, and the road had a river of water running through it. Well, with that kind of water on a road, if you were driving, the car could hydroplane. So you, you have to be careful about hydroplaning. Deeper water, if you're crossing a road or going through a really wide puddle that's got six or eight inches of water in it, um, it your engine could stall. Um, your engine could, your engine's nothing more than a big pump. It sucks up water and pushes out air or sucks up air and pushes out air out the tailpipe. Well, if it sucks up water, it can do serious damage to the engine. So um, if you get, if you get stuck and your car breaks down in the middle of a big flooded area, try to get out, you know, wait over to a safe area. It can sometimes in rushing water, it can only take eight or 10 inches of water and it, your car will actually float and it'll float away. And if your car is floating, you don't have any control. So look for the signs of, you know, bubbling water on the roadway, um, don't be the first one to drive through a big puddle because you don't know how deep it is. You don't know what caused it. Could be a sinkhole that caused it. It could be a water main that collapsed. Could be anything. So be very careful. And, um, you know, if it is really deep, you know, if it is a real flood, yeah, I guess you could climb on the roof of your car and wait for help rather than waiting inside of it. Um, every year we hear about cars that end up going off bridges and into the water. So what do you do? Well, first off, it doesn't happen very often. So don't be too concerned. I, I knew somebody who said, I don't wear my seatbelt because I'm afraid that if I go off the road and I go into a body of water, I'll drown because I won't be able to get out of my seatbelt. Well, chances are, if you went off the road and crashed through something and ended up in the water and you weren't wearing your seatbelt, you would have been knocked unconscious because you weren't wearing your seatbelt. So wear your seatbelt all the time. But if you do find yourself, and about six months ago, I read a story about somebody at two o'clock in the morning. We all know nothing good happens after midnight, right? Nothing good ever happens after midnight. And about two o'clock in the morning, somebody's, uh, somebody's car ended up in a big body of water. And fortunately, there were some people out and they rescued her. But if it does ever happen to you, you won't easily be able to get out of your car the pressure from the water on the outside into the inside of the car that is not full of water yet will be very hard to open the door. So chances are you won't be able to open the door until there's a fair amount of water inside the car. Um, I had a friend who was putting a boat in the water and his parking brake broke and his son was in the car and his boat and truck ended up down the boat ramp into the water. And his son was a, a, a young kid at the time, probably 12 years old, but he was a competition swimmer. And he literally just swam out the window and came back and said, dad, what happened to the truck? And, uh, and it wasn't that he didn't have the parking brake on and it wasn't, it wasn't in park. It just, it, for some reason, just the parking brake broke and, and it ended up in the water. So opening the window is possible. Open the door if you can, but you'll find that to try to open the door, you kind of have to let the car fill up with water. But again, this is something that doesn't happen very often. Um, car fires happen a little bit more often. Uh, there's about 500 
deaths per year that have to do with car fires. Um, if you notice any smell of smoke, pull over. Um, it might be an electrical issue. It might be just some short circuit under the dash, for instance, and all of a sudden you smell this burning thing and next thing you know, your radio doesn't work and okay, big deal, nothing bad happened. But on the other hand, it also could be something under the hood that could cause a, a, a more serious fire. And um, the, uh, the, the fire department refer to them as carbecues when your car catches on fire. And usually what happens is there's not a lot you can do. I was at work one day and somebody pulled up and I saw smoke coming out from under the hood of this car and the person got out and I said, I think your car's on fire. And I ran and got a fire extinguisher and he started to open the hood. And I said, no, no, don't open the hood because you don't want to let more air in that cause more fire. So um, we just opened the hood just a smidge and then took the fire extinguisher and sprayed under the hood and then opened the hood. And sure enough, it was a, um, it was a, a, um, a line for the power steering had burst and the power steering fluid hit the hot engine and actually caught on fire. And it was a, it, it could have turned into a very serious situation. Um, as it turned out, it, 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 you know, the car needed to be towed and probably needed a couple hundred dollars worth of repairs versus having to replace the car. If your car does catch on fire, run away. Uh, don't open the hood. And, um, you know, stuff under the hood and in the car are pretty toxic. Um, I was driving by a car fire out in the highway back uh, last summer. And as I'm driving away, I could hear the tires explode. So the tires exploded before the gas tank did. So um, you just, if something happens, you just want to make sure you stay away. So if you need to get a hold of me, jpaul at aanortheast.com, or if you go to our website, um, AAA, AAA.com slash car doctor is how you get there. And, um, and when that happens, I will, uh, I will, I will try to answer any question I can just about any time. So you can just go to, you can go to AAA and you can, you can find me there. And um, I'm always happy to try to answer people's car questions. And uh, so if I know we have a couple people on the, on here, if you have a question, um, you can, I will unmute you and unmute you, I think, or ask to unmute, I guess. So you can unmute yourself at this point, but if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, I have a question. I, I have a couple. Well, you always do. I always do. Thank you so much. This was great. I took a lot of notes. I saw um, you, I saw you taking notes. I was wondering <laughs> if you were taking notes or doing your grocery list. Yeah, that's later. Um, how do you tell this? I'm working backwards from as we we're talking about flash flood, you know, because sometimes there'll be, a, you know, some water on the road. How do you know what is OK? Like if you can you really tell like inch wise? Well, first, off, if you see the water actually puddling on the roadway. So usually what happens is roads are curved. They have a crown in them. So it's they're that way on purpose. So the water runs over to the gutter of the road. So whether you're out on a four lane highway or a country road, you'll notice that they always curve sort of to the edges. But if you start to notice the water puddling up on the road, and it only takes a, it only takes a half an inch of water or less to hydroplane. So in other words, you lose control of the car because the tires are on the water, especially if you're at speeds above 40 miles an hour, your car is likely to hydroplane. At lower speeds, 20 or 30 miles an hour, the weight of the car is kind of squishes down through the water. So, but the important, the, you know, there's roads with, you know, an inch or two of water on them, which are dangerous to drive on. And then there's roads that are literally flooded because a, you know, a dam broke way or a, uh, um, you know, a, a, in Rhode Island near our office, a few years ago, um, there was a shopping mall and it sort of was surrounded by three rivers. And we got rain and rain and rain. And what happened was all three rivers overflowed and the, um, the shopping mall actually got flooded. It actually had four feet of water inside of it. Well, all the roads right around those all became like flash floods and cars literally got, 
that were parked by the side of the road literally got picked up and floated. So that, you know, if you're driving and you're like, oh, it only looks like four inches of water, but you see it running like a stream and you, and you get in it and all of a sudden it picks your car up. Well, it's first off, it's more than four inches and you can, you can literally, your car can float away and it's only going to stop, you know, law of physics is going to stop when it hits something that doesn't move. So, so the best thing is to be very observant. Um, if you're out and it's raining so hard, you can't see where you're going, stop going, you know, pull over if you can pull over, put your emergency flashes on and let the rain come to a little bit of a, you know, slow down. I was up in the Pocono mountains had to be 10 years ago. And I've never been out in such a hard rainstorm where finally I pulled, um, I pulled under an overpass because it was just raining so hard. I just couldn't see. And, you know, I was still watching people go by me and I'm like, how did, how can these people possibly see where they're going? And sure enough, you know, further on the road, somebody didn't see where they were going and, and slid off the edge of the road. So, um, so just be observant, look for the water, look for puddling, you know, look for puddling water that that's going to tell you there's enough water on the road where your car can slip and slide and hydroplane. And then if it looks like the water's literally running down the road and it has some depth to it, you, you want to try to get out of that. You don't want to be involved in that because that could, doesn't happen very often, but it could actually, you know, float your car away. And, it, and again, it doesn't take, you think it takes, you know, you, you watch some of the flood pictures from Florida or Texas and they're wading through, you know, waist deep water, but it doesn't take you know, eight inches or 10 inches of water for your car to get picked up and float away. So that helps. And so then if you're in your car and it happens, like I say, you're stuck in traffic and the water's just coming and coming, then like you just follow the, what you had talked about before about, you know, trying to get out, get on your- Yeah, um, if, if, your car, if your car is just sort of stuck and it's being, um, it's being surrounded by water, you know, say, um, you know, and you don't know how, how, uh, how high it's going to go. Yeah. If you get, if you can get out of your car and climb up on top of it. Um, I was in, I was in a uh, parking lot of a supermarket in Key West, Florida, and it started to rain and it really started to rain. And I look, and I'm like, I'll just stay in the car until the rain stops. And I looked out and there was about two feet of water now. And, you know, I'm still sitting in the car. So that the car didn't float away. But um, I sort of parked near the storm drain. And I guess, well, the storm drain's there because the parking lot sort of dipped down in the middle. And that's why they put the drain there. But I looked out and, you know, at one point, the water was starting to seep in the car, um, which made me happy I was in a rental and not my own car. Um, but it was, you know, and, and it was starting to get a little wet in there, but the rain had stopped and it was starting to, and, you know, five minutes later or 10 minutes later, the water had gone down, but still I'm like, it's amazing how fast water can collect. So, you know, if you're in your car and you feel like you're safe, just, you know, sit in the car and, you know, but if you think, Hey, look, I don't know, I'm in two feet or three feet of water and it stopped raining and I don't want to have somebody think I'm not in the car, you know, if you can get out and kind of climb up on the hood or the roof or something, just so somebody can see you so they can come and get you. Um, we rescued somebody last year in a bad flood and their car was in the water and um, we went over and we dragged the car out of the water and the woman said, oh my, oh, you know, oh, I think you, I think you, you know, damaged the tire. And the tow truck driver looked at her and said, you don't understand your car's totaled. You know, you're, you, you ran into a big puddle of water. The engine's no good now. And the inside of the car is all wet. Your car, don't worry about your tire, your cars. And, and she, she checked with her insurance company and sure enough, her car was totaled. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, the other question I had that was um, along with that was that you had said, um, if you can pull off the shoulder safely, um, do so. Um, but if you, can't pull or, you, or stay in your car and if you can't if you're not safely off the road you get out of your car depends 
um, if you can get out of your car safely and get to a point of safety, so in other words, a Jersey barrier and you can kind of jump over the Jersey barrier and be on the other side of the Jersey barrier. And say it's a, you know, around our area, a lot of breakdown lanes at certain times of the day are travel lanes. So there is no breakdown lane. So, mm -hmm. but if you can pull off to the edge and get to a place of safety, go ahead and do that. If you can't, then what you want to do is make sure your emergency flashers are on and you're sitting in your car with your seatbelt on. Because if somebody hits you, you want to be protected. And you want to make sure your seatbelt's on. Um, sometimes what happens is people break down. They're like, oh, I'll just wait for help. And I you know, kick back in the front seat and I got my feet up on the dash. And that isn't how you want to be. You want to be in your car with your seatbelt on, protected in case someone hits you. Um, if you break down in the middle of nowhere, stay in your car unless you know where you are and you know hey look you know there's a half a mile down the road there's a burger king that's open 24 hours a day i'll go there and wait for help but if you don't know where you are the worst thing you can do is start walking because you don't know what's up next there's it could be bears up there who knows but you know <laughs> but you don't want to you don't want to be yeah you don't want to be in there could be zombies who knows what could be up there so um, you want to stay in your car, emergency flashes on, if, providing they work, and uh, try to call for help if possible. If you have, you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and there's no cell phone service, you got to wait for, you know, somebody to spot you and say there might be a car broken down. But you don't want to just start walking by the edge of the road because then potentially you could get hit because somebody doesn't expect to see you. And, uh, and on a busy, busy roadway, you want to, if you can get out of your, you know, say you can get out of the passenger seat, passenger door, and you can get kind of, even if it's up on an embankment and just sit there until help comes. I saw somebody broken down on Route 95 heading to New York one day, and they're sitting on the trunk of their car, stuck in, you know, stuck over by the edge of the road. And I'm like, what a horrible thing to do, because somebody could have slammed right into them and, you know, you know, who knows what would have happened? So, yeah. you know, that's the worst thing you can do. So stay in your car if you can, you know, if, if you can't stay in your car or if you can't find a good safe place to be, stay in your car. But the, the important thing is to stay safe. Okay, I'm looking to see if I had anything. I think those are the questions that, that I it? had. Um, well, well, the other, other one, um, like you said that that AAA will test your battery, right? Like, cause usually batteries, is there any warning at all? Or is it just like we go out one day and your battery doesn't start? In the summertime, batteries actually, batteries are funny. It, heat is what actually affects the ba a battery the most. People think it's cold, but it's really the heat. Heat is what does the damage to a battery. The winter time is what makes a battery work the hardest because the engine's harder to crank over, the weather's colder. If you've ever had any kind of battery operated device, flashlight, whatever the case is, they don't work as good in cold weather as they do in nice weather because the cold takes the life out of the battery. So in the summertime, say you're parked in a shopping mall parking lot and you're in the mall for three hours, you come out, you turn the key, nothing happens. And you go, what happened? That's the battery failing in hot weather. But sometimes what will happen is the battery will undergo some damage over the summer. It'll still start the car. But the first cold day, um, it doesn't have enough capacity to crank the engine over. So you, you call for help. You have your own little jump start thing. You have a neighbor with a set of jumper cables. And you go, OK, I started up. Now it's good. Now that didn't fix the problem. All that did was fix the symptom, which was the car didn't start. You want to fix the problem. The average life of a battery in the Northeast is a little under five years. Um, in hot weather states like Florida and Arizona, the average life of a battery is closer to two years because the, wow. heat, the heat affects the battery. So if you, have, if you have a five or six year old car with the original battery in it, chances are it's on its last legs. And it might be a good idea to have it tested. And the only real way to tell is to have the battery tested. The symptoms are maybe you 
crank the engine over and it just doesn't, it sounds dragging, like it just doesn't have enough power. Or you go to start it and you notice the, the check engine lights on for whatever reason. Well, that could be that the battery's not the voltage it shouldn't be. Or you open the hood and you see a lot of corrosion around the top of the battery. That's a sign maybe the battery's starting to act up. But generally there's not a lot of signs. And the best thing to look for though, is to go someplace where they can test the battery, where they have the right tools to test it. Um, we have, we have um, dedicated battery trucks that go out and test people's batteries. And, and um, you know, we can, we can let you know what kind of shape it's in. Uh, I tested the batteries in both of our cars and they're both in good shape. They'll both be fine for the winter, um, but um, you know, you never know, especially one of our cars is, um, is a 2015. So technically it's on the end, end of its life, but the batteries still tested are okay. The other car is newer, it's only two years old. And um, that battery that battery's in fantastic shape right now. But the thing that also hurts batteries is letting the battery go dead. So whether it's you left your lights on and the battery died and you got a jump start, it never comes back a hundred percent. Uh, the other thing that hurts batteries is lack of use. So during these COVID times, people aren't driving as much. So, you know, some people are letting their cars sit for two, three, or four weeks at a time. Um, try to get in your car once a week and just go for a drive, go for a half an hour drive. Um, that will hit, help keep the battery charged. It'll help exercise the car. It'll, uh, brakes even get a little rusty sitting still. So doing that half hour drive, do a little bit of sightseeing, and uh, your car will thank you for it. That's a really good point about during COVID. I bet a lot of people's cars were sitting yeah, in their I, driveways. I try to get a little exercise in the morning. I don't look it, but I try to get a little exercise in the morning. And uh, so I kind of walk around my neighborhood and I'm amazed at the amount of cars in people's driveways and I live in a neighborhood where the houses are on little tiny lots and they're really close together. But I'm amazed at the cars in people's driveways that don't look like they've moved since March. Um, they've been sitting there and, you know, I kind of look at, oh, you know, that ex inspection sticker is expiring soon. Or, oh, look, there's that car's got a low tire. And, you know, a month later, it's got two low tires now because yeah. the car just hasn't gone anywhere, whether that person's working at home and they're just using the other car or there's a um, neighbor near me and um, it's a rental house and it has a couple of roommates in it. And one person never leaves the house and the other person must do all the shopping. And um, they do get a lot of takeout food, uh, but, <laughs> but they, um, but uh, they have a Ford Explorer and it now has just about two flat tires. They're not quite flat, but they're almost flat. And that car hasn't, that car hasn't moved since March 13th or something. So, so uh, there are people I get, I get calls from a lot of people in the city in Manhattan that want to know what they should do with their car because they haven't driven it since COVID started. And I said, chances are, it's probably not going to start because it's been sitting for too long. So, you know, getting road service to come out and jumpstart it, don't just start it and say, okay, I said, start it and drive it to your repair garage and have them go through it and make sure all the fluids are in good shape and then have them use a battery charger and charge the battery up because that battery really needs to be charged by a battery charger, not just driving it. But if you let your car sit for a week or even two on the long side, um, you know, driving it around will recharge the battery, but it also just kind of exercises everything. It keeps the tires rounder. It keeps things from sticking and rusting. It's just good for the car. That's, that's really, yeah. Wow. I yeah. didn't even think about that. Yeah. And don't be, and, and I know we talked about it before, but don't be that concerned about having a car serviced either. The service places don't want to get sick either. So they're wiping down your car when you get it. They're going to wipe it down when they give it back. If you want to wipe it down afterwards, just to be extra careful, that's fine. If you're really, um, really, really concerned about COVID, which people should be, um, let your car sit for three or four days. And, you know, while the CDC says the virus only lasts even on stainless steel, three days. So inside your car, it's only going to last hours to a day or something probably anyway. But, you know, if you're really concerned that, um, 
you know, you even to the point where some garages will pick up and drop off, you know, oh, they brought me my car back. I'm afraid to drive it because that guy looked like he was coughing when he was walking away. Um, let us sit, let us sit for a day or two. It'll be fine. You'll be fine because the virus doesn't last that long. So. Okay. Um, I don't know. I see no Susan's still on here. I don't know if she has any questions. Um, if you do, you can unmute yourself or you can write something in the chat. Um, otherwise, otherwise. Um, Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. And again, uh, if people so if people want to get a hold of me, my email is jpaul at aaanortheast.com or aaa.com slash car doctor. Always happy to answer people's car questions. Thanks so much, John. And thanks for all the ideas now for uh, Christmas gifts. I'm going to make the, some of those um, emergency bags. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Okay.